Well, good evening. My name is Evan Gregory, and this is, once again, Bible Answers. We're going to be looking at the Church of Philadelphia, primarily, primarily looking at uh, what it says about that church in Revelation. So follow along with, I'll have all of our verses here on the screen. As always, this is brought to you by the North Columbus Church of Christ, located in Columbus, Mississippi. And our website is scrolling below me, it's NorthColumbusChristians.com. We also put these videos up on YouTube. And uh, our YouTube is North Columbus Church of Christ. And so, again, we're looking at the Church of Philadelphia. Remember in the first, uh, well, really in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, we see where seven churches are spoken to uh, by Christ. And most of them had uh, some problems. But Philadelphia is the one of, I believe, two. I believe only Philadelphia and Smyrna uh, were the only churches that had nothing uh, negative said about it and so we're going to look at philadelphia and really what we need to pay attention to is because nothing negative is said uh that if we are christians we ought to seek to have the same characteristics that we see on display in philadelphia so we're going to make note of that as well and so going right into the lesson here is a map and um this is a map of Approximately where the seven those seven cities uh, where the seven churches are, are located You see at the very beginning of that orange line That is where the Isle of Patmos is and that was where John was exiled And so this is where he was at while he uh, was writing Revelation and so we see that um, th The churches are relatively in the same area. Uh, there's not just a whole lot of uh, distance between them uh, but it's all it's important that we pay attention to uh, everything that was said about these churches because I think there's something uh, for everybody and at least probably for every congregation uh, in, in the planet that um, There are some things going on in some of those churches that would probably uh, Be going on in other churches uh, currently and I think the same prescription on how to change certain things and uh, To keep on doing what they've always been doing uh, all those things have remained the same and so we we'll look at the beginning when it begins to uh, to when when we see uh, Jesus begin to talk about the church of Philadelphia and says and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia right uh, these things says he who is holy he who is true He who has a key of David he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one's opens. So he begins Basically giving a description of himself and if you notice you can go look at all those churches before he begins, you know, he will say to the angel of the church of so-and-so. Uh, and after this, there is some description that is made of himself. And in this case, he describes himself as he who is holy and he who is true. And so we could, you know, just talk about this idea of Christ being the truth and being holy uh, for a while just in and of itself. But we see you know, where Christ is described as the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he's described as the Holy One of God. We see in Revelation 3, verse 14, that he describes himself as a true and faithful witness. And so if we want to know truth, uh, we can receive that through Christ. Uh, we see that that is the, uh, and John writes back in chapter 14 and verse 6, that uh, he is the way, the truth, and like no man uh, comes to the Father except through him. So if we, we can know the truth, and the only way we can access that is through uh, him faith in him and so he continues to describe himself as he who has the key of David He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens So he describes himself as he who has a key of David pretty interesting uh, Description here and where this is coming from is way back in Isaiah chapter 22 and, and in verse uh, 22 and in the context he's not talking about uh, he's not talking about Christ. He's not talking about uh, the Messiah here, uh, but it says that the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open, and no one shall shut, and he shall shut, and no one shall open. And in this context, in verses 20 through 23, it says, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility in, into his hands. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And so we see that he's talking about 
this fellow by the name of Eliakim. And if you read your Bibles, you will uh, see more of this fellow. And so this man, uh, he's going to be that he was going. He says that he's going to be clothed with the robe and strengthened uh, with his uh, strengthen him with your belt. Because I will commit your responsibility into his hands. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of, of Judah. So it talks about this new responsibility that he was going to have. And again, we see where now it's referencing this key of the house of David. And, I, and here in, in this situation, I think he's talking about uh, the literal uh the house of, of david here that basically this guy is going to have power and authority he's going to be able to dictate who comes and, and goes into this house you know and, and, and kind of like the the, the right hand man of the, of the king so to speak and so this is where this is coming from and so going back to that let's go back we went the wrong way going back to, to revelation that we see that he has the that he has the key of David, that he has his key uh, to this kingdom, uh, that he has power and authority, not in this physical sense, not as having uh, the kingdom here on this earth, uh, but he dictates who gets to come and go in into his kingdom. He gets to set uh, the rules on who uh, becomes a part of his kingdom, that being Christ's kingdom, and who doesn't? Revelation 12 and verses 10 through 11 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the, and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So we see where says salvation strength the kingdom of god the power of christ has come and now the accuser that being satan has been cast down and it says that they overcame satan how by the blood of the lamb by the blood of jesus by the word of their testimony so through christ you know their obedience to christ as well and uh they've remained faithful to him regardless if, if that even uh, meant death and so all of those things, the, the sin, Satan, all those things have been cast down. But notice this this phrase is salvation, strength, the kingdom of God, the power of his Christ has come. So nobody is living in uh, or, you know, nobody has or everybody has the opportunity rather to turn from their sin, to be done with that. And uh, they no longer have to, to le live in fear. Of the consequences of those things it's in second peter verses 1 through 10 and 11 it says therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things you will never stumble for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord savior jesus christ so again do these things be diligent to make your call and election sure and if you do these things you're going to be able to enter this everlasting kingdom of Christ. And so again, I, I think here that it's obvious that he's talking about this spiritual kingdom, that they're going to have this eternal life, eternal reward. And he's not talking about some physical kingdom here on the earth. Going back to the church of Philadelphia in verse 8, says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. It's another phrase here, I know your works, is also mentioned in all these other churches, that he's well aware of what's going on here. So if there's if there's bad things, obviously this is not a good situation for the church. And he's paying attention to their sins. He knows what they need to repent of. They're not going to be able to escape any consequences. But for those that are faithful, uh, that's a comforting thought for them, that God, even though people may hate them, Nobody gives them any, you know, praise or anything like that. God knows uh, there's works. And he says that they have, he has set before them an open door and no one can shut it. And we, I don't know exactly what this open door is. People speculate saying that maybe this is an open door for evangelism or whatever it may be, and, and possibly. But uh, I think this ties in with the, the last part of this verse, that they have a little strength, they have kept my word, have not denied my name that this entrance uh, into this kingdom, this open door into this kingdom uh, is there. 
for them. No, no one can shut it, right? And so as long as they keep his word, uh, they don't deny his name, they're going to be able uh, to enter it. And interesting enough, he says, for you have a, a little strength. And uh, we don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, right here with, with Philadelphia, they're, they're struggling, obviously. But uh, he says they, just, they still have a little bit to go. They still have a little bit of strength. They can still keep on going. Uh, that they're not completely played out and they're not exhausted. Uh, they can keep on doing uh, what is right. Um, verse 9, it says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that there are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I've loved you. So he's talking about the synagogue of Satan here. And, and again, uh, we see where, you know, it, it seems apparent that they're uh, having some issues with what's called the synagogue of Satan. But he says here that we don't have any confusion on, on who these people are. It says that they are Jews and are, they say they are Jews and are not. So I think what's going on here is Christ is describing actual Jews as the synagogue of Satan. And uh, so we can look through the New Testament. We can see how the Jews seems like constantly are persecuting Christians or at the very least just causing problems uh, for the spread of the gospel. And we see here that Christ describes them as a synagogue of Satan. Remember, I don't exactly uh, remember the passage, uh, but God calls uh, Jewish leaders or he, he says rather uh, that the Jewish leaders, their, their father is Satan. And he's not saying that they, their, their father is literally Satan, but he's saying you are doing the things of Satan. You have the same attitude as Satan. And so, therefore, you may say that your father is Abraham or, uh, you know, Isaac or Jacob or whoever it may be. Well, if your father was them, you would be acting like them. But rather, you're acting like Satan, and therefore your father uh, is Satan as well. And so they say that they're Jews, but they're actually not. Uh, remember what said in Romans 2 and verses 28 through 29. It says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nowhere is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he who is a Jew is one inwardly, and, who, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so those that were really Jews, or are ones that are faithful to God. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. They're not uh, following uh, the old law. Uh, they're following God, and we see, and 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 also following Christ. And um, if they were true followers of the law and true followers of the what is written in the Old Testament, they would have come to uh, believe Christ, uh, but they they chose not to. So again, we see. Who they are really, uh, who they are really following, but this synagogue of Satan, we see that they're going to be that they're going to come and worship before uh, their feet. And again, I, I don't, I don't think this is literal. I mean, it could be, but I don't think they're they're literally saying that uh, Jesus is literally saying that uh, these these Jews are going to come worship at the feet of these Christians here in Philadelphia. Rather, I think this is a description of, of the Jews that they are eventually going to recognize who uh, these Christians actually are, uh, that, that, that they were of the truth, that they should have paid attention uh, to what they were, what they were doing, what they were saying. And uh, all of these things are going to be uh, made right. Instead of being persecuted, instead of being troubled by these Jews, now the Jews are going to pretty much turn a uh, 180 degrees, that they're going to love them. Uh, that they're going, it says it here, that they're going to worship uh, before them. And, and again, that they are going to know uh, that Christ loved them, that God loved them as well. Verse 10, it says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of tri trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Notice again, they're, they, that, that they are persevering, they are enduring, uh, you know, bad situations. And because of that, they're going to be kept from some hour trial which will come upon the whole world. 
And again, we're, we're left with some questions. I don't know exactly what uh, is being said here. Is this just persecution of Christians? So, for example, Rome persecuting Christians? Or is this tied in with uh, the Jewish rebellion and destruction of their temple in AD 70? We know that there were Jews around, and, and maybe maybe they would have to deal uh, with some of the uh, with some of the, uh, uh, the, the the Roman aggression against Jews. I don't know exactly, uh, but whatever this is, they're going to be uh, they're not going to have to face all those things. They're not going to struggle, right? So those there's going to be others that are that they're going to be tested, but rather they're going to be removed from that simply because they have kept this command uh, to persevere. And so in some situations, we see where these Christians, they don't really get a whole lot of relief from any type of persecution or testing or whatever, but at least we see in Philadelphia that God pays attention uh, to their struggles. And at least in this particular situation, he lets them know Hey, these other people are going to have it rough, but you're going to be okay uh, because you've kept my command. And going into verse 11 and 12, he says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I, shall, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Again, he tells them that um, hold fast, continue, uh, continue to endure, continue to persevere. Notice what he says. He says, he who overcomes, I'm going to make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. He's going to write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. We see all these other uh, descriptions as well. Uh, just briefly going through all of these descriptions. Remember, Christ is describing as uh, as he has the key of the house of David, that uh, he that he had given Philadelphia an unclosable door. We see the Jews were going to worship before them, and then going back in those few verses, we see that they were going to that they were going to have a crown, so no one may take their crown. He says that they were going to be a pillar in the temple. Let's go back here. He says he was going. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. And then we see that he's going to be. And that he's going to have this name of the city of my God. And um, and and so what's interesting here, you see all these reference, at least in my mind, to rule authority, government. And um, we see who's in charge. And God is saying, if you just hold fast, hold fast what you have, you still have a little bit of strength uh, that um, everything's going to work out. That you may not have, you may have very little or nothing right now, but now you're going to be a pillar in the temple of my God, a crucial element in this temple. That you're going to be a part of the city of God as well. That God is going to write on him uh, my new name. Uh, so, I mean, he's going to be his. That uh, there's there's no if ands or buts about it. And so God is making clear to them that they that they are his, and nobody can, can take that away from them. And so they receive all of that by keeping his word, so they're described as having kept his word. They have not denied his name. They have persevered. Again, he tells them to hold fast. So this is what, this or this is how uh, they receive those rewards. And then in verse 13, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and again this is i believe every church and at least at least most of the churches uh they're they're all told to, to hear uh, what the spirit says to the church and you pay attention to what's uh, being said that this is not just this is not john writing but rather we see jesus speaking but we also he see here that this is what also this spirit is saying so we have john writing we have words of jesus and we also say this is coming from the spirit as well so again this is valid this is legitimate they better be careful and they better pay attention to what is being being said here and so this finishes up 
the lesson. I hope that it's been useful for you. But again, uh, you, people will, I guess, think about, well, or uh, worry about, well, how am I going to be faithful uh, towards God, or what does all that look like? But what we see here is that it's uh, pretty simple. Now, in application, I think it's a little bit more difficult, but the prescription for being faithful is keeping his word, enduring, persevering, uh, just keeping on doing what he what he says. And uh, if you do that, everything's going to work out right. Now, again, that is simple. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost foolproof, uh, but the application of it is, is much more difficult than just saying those things. So I hope that it's been useful for all of you. Again, uh, we try to do these videos every week or or uh, pretty regular anyway. But we always try to do them at Sundays at 7 p.m. Um, and uh, if you want to see these videos in the future, uh, in you know some future time, or if you want to look at past videos, obviously you can see them on our Facebook page, but also YouTube is another source in which you can find all of our videos YouTube. Uh, but until next time, I hope that this has been useful for you, and I hope that you all have a good day and a good rest of the week. Thanks.